Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, maybe good afternoon, I guess. I just switched over. Um, uh, so I guess uh, we're going to be going into the water-wise gardening maintenance in 101. Um, just to give a little bit of background on myself, uh, I've uh, studied, uh, worked in landscaping professionally for about 10 years now, um, and about 20 plus years personally. Um, and uh, I studied uh, horticulture at Santa Barbara City College, ecological restoration more specifically, um, where we learned about uh, water-wise plants and um, soil health and IPM, irrigation, restoration, things like that. Uh, studied um, uh, as an arborist under Bill Spiewak at, uh, also at City College and took the uh, permaculture design course there. Um, also, and then in continue edu continuing education, uh, went on to learn about gray water um, through Laura Allen and um, farm scale earthworks uh, with Warren Brush, uh, farm scale design with Darren Doherty and uh, soil health with the Soil Health Academy and people like Gabe Brown, Ray Archuleta and Alan Williams. So there's, uh, you know, got a kind of list of things that of a windy road of education, but a method of learn, do, teach, repeat is something I try to follow. And so, uh, that's some of the windy road there. Um, and uh, Barbara, if you'd like to maybe introduce yourself there, Barbara Wishingrad from Sweetwater Collaborative. Sure, thanks, Josh. Um, uh, my name is Barbara Wishingrad, and I'm not getting the green light uh, for my audio. Can hear you. Uh, you can hear me? Okay, great. So um, I'm the executive director of Sweetwater. Glad that you are all here. This is one of my passions, actually, maintenance, because we have done a lot of installations and we find that to really make landscapes sustainable and to work over a long period of time, there needs to be good maintenance. And um, I've been an organic gardener since I was 19 and really love that. I've also been through the uh, environmental horticulture program at City College and I'm a permaculture designer and um, am currently also working in the landscape through Regenerative Landscape Alliance with Josh and one of our other instructors, Fred Hunter. Um, anyway, welcome. Cool. Um, so first, uh, we'll start with the, uh, the overview here. Um, where we'll look at uh, you know plant establishment and irrigation, um, pruning techniques, um, fertilization and mulch, integrated pest management or IPM, uh, and some different tools that you might use in the landscape. Uh, next. We can go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. uh, the importance of manscape, uh, maintenance. Excuse me. Waterwise landscapes are not just sustainable, uh, they can be regenerative over time. This requires regular maintenance, maintenance, especially over the first few years of establishment. By becoming familiar with the unique cycles of plants in your yard, you can save time, water, and money, and eventually make your landscape work for you. Garden maintenance is key to thriving plants, biologically rich soil, uh, lower water use, and long-term sustainability. Um, Next. Uh, the establishment period um, for a new garden is up to three years. Uh, the, 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 the terms kind of used there are weep, creep, and leap. Um, although water-wise landscapes are designed to store and save um, time um, or save water and, and time, plants will need, uh, will need a lot of water during the first one to two years. Um, they need really a lot of water close in that first year, that, that weep year. They would like some uh, water close to the roots. We wanna keep it moist, not soggy, um, and just kind of monitor the way they look as we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see a little bit later on in, um, in some of the maintenance images. Um, and then in year two, the creep year, uh, the roots are starting to kind of reach down towards the rain basins and towards the water sources. And you can start to see the plants start to jump just a little bit. Um, 
And then in year three, the plants have really started to establish uh, and are starting to thrive. And you can start to wean and taper off a little bit of irrigation and maybe start to go towards um, water when you need it, kind of. Um, and then by year four, uh, hopefully we should be able to remove those native plants and other um, climate appropriate plants uh, from irrigation and go to more, more rainfall, hopefully if the rainfall is there in the right season. Okay. Um, Josh, I just want to say that um, people should be prepared if you have not yet planted water-wise plants, that sometimes your water bill goes up a little bit in the first couple of years. And don't be alarmed by this because a good establishment is really, really important in the landscape. And then your water bill will drop for a longer period of time if you have gone through the the important work of establishing them well. Right. Uh, so here you can see uh, three images of a garden. And on the, on the left there, you see the, the weep years where the plants have just been planted. They're covered nicely with mulch, um, or not covered in mulch, but uh, the, the soil's covered with mulch, uh, protecting the, the plants. And then you see in the image, the second image there in the middle, you see those plants starting to grow and starting to thrive and starting to climb out um, of their, you know, just kind of general um, pot size. And you can see some flowers starting in there. And then that third image, you can really see them that have taken over and started to cover all of their spaces and really started to habitate everything. And you can see that you can, or, and, and at this point you can start to cut some water use um, here start to taper back a little bit of water and start watering in season. Um, and this garden in particular has some rain basins in there. So it gets a little bit of extra um, water from the, the roof above in the seasonal time, but that's a different story. Um, you know, this is a good example of that weep, creep and leap. Um, moving along to irrigation. Uh, there's controller duration and frequency of how you can control your clock, uh, succulents versus natives, meadows, efficient irrigation type, drip versus sprinkler, manual versus automatic. So we'll kind of just go through all those different things um, in this next section. Um, controlling duration and frequency of irrigation. Um, this can be uh, this can be adjusted based off of plant needs, um, soil type, and climate. Um, you know, if you have like a clay soil, you might taper your irrigation down a little bit until you can get the, um, the, the carbon content up a little bit more so it can receive a little bit more water. Um, and depending on the climate, you know, how hot or how dry it, you know, or how hot and dry it is versus how wet and cold it is, um, you might want to make some adjustments. So usually in Santa Barbara area, it's mostly the, the hot and dry and wet and cold. Um, and then the duration and frequency can also be controlled by that controller, um, which is uh, very effective um, in those two seasons, basically. Um, so we can go on to the next, next slide. Um, watering succulents versus natives. Um, there's different strategies for all plants. Um, so this is you know just kind of a basic um, idea here. But uh, a lot of native plants, they kind of want um, infrequent deep watering uh, when they're established. And, and they want that in the right season, not necessarily during the dry season, but um, uh, in that dry season, the summer season, you might see them um, start to struggle a little bit. So there might be a time when you want to give them a little bit of a drink because their gas tank might be um, kind of on empty. Um, so give them a little bit of water in the hot season is a good idea sometimes. Um, but generally speaking, infrequent deep watering in the right time of year, mimicking when we would be getting water <laughs> in that rainy season. And then with the succulents, um, not too much different there. You can kind of see with them when they're starting to brown out and, then and um, their leaves are starting to, starting to desiccate and shrivel. Uh, maybe they're starting to change colors. And that would be a good time to give them water, but they don't really need a, a lot of water frequently. They just need some water from time to time, again, in season, but a little bit less than the natives. 
they have a little bit more water in their in their kind of fleshy leaves but but um, every plant has a little bit of variation there um, but uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts there Barbara that you'd like to mention. yeah I um, what I'd like to say is that succulents in general need um, not very deep deep watering because their roots are not very deep as opposed to the natives which watering deep is actually the best strategy for them so that's kind of like the biggest difference between them but like josh says every plant is different but we're trying to give you some generalizations here so you have some idea and you can experiment from there and on those on those natives if you go back to that the kind of the um, the weep, creep, and leap. Again, if you think the soil, you go to soil moisture, not um, not soggy. You want you want the soil to be moist, not soggy. Um, so that's kind of a big deal. And then you can start to gradually taper back that irrigation over those two and three years. Then hopefully you'll be into just infrequent deep watering when it needs be in that fourth year um, and after. Um, cool. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, waterwise meadow, um, a waterwise meadow is um, we're trying to get climate appropriate plants and um, things that are going to really thrive in our area. So grasses um, have unique watering, um, and they want that kind of more like that native uh, landscape, that deep, deep watering, um, and. Uh, sometimes infrequent uh, it depends on kind of what the look you're going for if you're okay with it uh, browning out a little bit um, in the hotter season you can taper off the water and that's okay that's kind of a little bit of that look that you see there with those kind of uh, browner grasses in the background um, but then some of the greener grasses you might want to give a little you know areas where you wanted to stay green you might give it a little bit more water so the, the watering strategy can can fluctuate and uh, but looking at the health of the plant is really a major key for us and trying to match the uh, the water needs of the plant in the season and time at which it should be getting it um, so native plants that's easy um, other plants um, uh, require a little bit more thought to looking at there um, and most most of the just real quickly on the last bit most most grasses like kind of lawn type stuff in the middle are going to need a little bit of a, um, a spray that's kind of hard to get away from and some of those taller tougher grasses we can get away with uh, more of a drip type system which we'll talk a little bit more about in the future but just kind of that image kind of is helpful to see those taller grasses you're going to need more of a drip for and the grasses um, spray is pretty much the way to go is, and, but timing of the spray is the key <laughs> Um, in the morning, usually pre-dawn when the sun is down. Um, anyway, um, next slide is good. Next. There. Um, so yeah, here's kind of a little bit of an evaluation of drip versus sprinklers. Irrigation systems are notoriously inefficient. Um, as soon as as soon as you set up an uh, irrigation system, it is immediately starting to depreciate in value, much like the car that you purchased. Right when you buy it, roll it off the track, it starts to lose its value and starts to eventually need some help. Um, so when you look at a drip irrigation system, uh, drip is generally about eighty percent efficient, um, and what that that efficiency is really about um, where the water is being delivered and how it's being delivered. So usually it's being, it says here directly to the roots. Um, I would say it's directly to the soil um, and maybe to a mulch layer um, and then down kind of into the roots. Um, and this limits a lot of evaporation. Um, the caveat to that is, is that you get the drip generally pretty localized. So it doesn't get a lot of full coverage completely around a plant. So there can be some challenges there. Um, a sprinkler system, is 40 to 60 percent efficient, um, mostly due to poor distribution. Um, sprinklers can be converted to drip uh, through a simple retrofit. Um, and so there's a little pop-up you can, uh, yeah, you can, you can plug the, the sprayers and uh, the sprinkler systems, you can just cap them and then you can have the little drip conversion that plugs right on to um, the same riser mechanism and then you can run a drip off of that. So you don't have to do a lot of big changing of PVC and stuff. Um, so there can be simple modifications for sprinklers. 
Um, but yeah, they're very, they're pretty well inefficient. And mostly that's due to um, it not getting to the right spot, poor distribution, and also to evaporation, some loss to evaporation there as well on the sprinklers. Um, but you're always gonna get loss as you can tell by both of these. Um, but uh, we can move on there, I think. Um, yeah, there's a difference between uh, manual versus auto, you know, automatic, automatic watering, excuse me. Um, and, you know, the timers are wonderful systems. They're very helpful um, in terms of hands off and um, being able to go on vacations or whatever. Um, we're also getting water out at the appropriate time early in the morning. Um, and uh, more manual systems are, are also great if you have a smaller garden um, and things that you can really keep an eye on. Um, we, we, we do think uh, using a hose is wonderful at the appropriate time, um, but you have to really manage the amount that you're putting out and, and look, at the, look at the plants and make sure that they're happy when you're giving them water. Or, I mean, if, if they, excuse me, look, that they're looking dry and uh, you want to give them water to give them a little bit of happiness. Um, you know, using a hose can be a wonderful way to do that to one or two plants rather than giving it to your whole garden um, when some things are looking dry. So um, different systems, automatic, sy automatic systems are wonderful, um, but they do have their flaws. Times, you know, the, when the power goes out, sometimes they, they kick off and switch on to uh, new timing and things. So they, they have their flaws and their challenges, but they're very excellent in terms of water management overall. So sometimes we um, use a combination of hand watering mm -hmm. and using a controller. So you might have things set to a basic um, system that just basically irrigates the plants all year. And in the summer, for example, you might notice like Josh was saying, if things are looking a little sad, then you can specifically focus on the plants that need some extra water. So hand watering can actually be very more effective sometimes than using the controller because you are only watering what needs it instead of watering everything at once. But like I say, a combination is often um, the way that makes the most sense. Next. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh pruning general guidelines, um, prune water-wise plants before they get woody. As plants bloom, um, begin to fade, pinch off, or cut off the flowers, the flower stems below, um, below the spent flower and just above the, the first set of full healthy leaves. Do this, <clears throat> excuse me, do this with all the dead flowers on the plant. This is called deadheading and is a good practice for many plants. Pruning, um, pruning is best done by thinning, pruning out old branches instead of topping or shaping. Um, so yeah, we use, uh, um, in the field, we use a lot of uh, aesthetic practices, aesthetic pruning practices and healthy pruning practices. And a lot of those are looking for uh, the branches where the branches break. Um, love to do thinning cuts rather than heading cuts. So that, that thinning cut is cutting back to a branch of uh, about 50% or more of the, the trunk that it's coming off of. And then a heading cut would be like cutting it right, kind of like right in the middle of your finger here. And then what you end up with is a little kind of lion tuft at the end, a little lion's tail. So we try to cut them back towards the, the node or the, the, the you know, kind of the split of the branch, which is a great way to thin. And then you're always wanting to take out uh, dead wood and, um, you know, leaf, dead debris, leaf stuff, crossing, br crossing branches. Um, there's a lot of little things that you can do aesthetically that are also healthy for the plant. So, um, yeah, if you, if you we, we try not to prune for shape so much as for the, the, the feel and the, the vibrance of the plant itself. It has its own, it, the plant has its own shape and the way it wants to grow. So we try to help, um, manage that but so that it also keeps the garden from overgrowing too into the into the walking path you know or into the doorway or covering a light so um, there's ways to prune those things aesthetically without damaging them Great. the health next 
uh, yeah, here we are removing dead disease or crossing branches, <laughs> kind of going back over a little bit of that. Um, some plants need to be cut back as much as possible to a node to the growth. Um, if there are new sprouts, so kind of water sprouts, those green sprouts that shoot off often from the trunk or shoot, uh, shoot off directly from the top of a branch and they just go straight up. Uh, we like to take those out kind of any time. Um, others need to be cut back to half or a third of their size after their blooms. Some plants have certain um, times of year when it's better to prune them, others do not. So uh, yeah, there's a bunch of different each plant kind of have its, has its own uh, needs as far as this goes. And um, we, we call it kind of in the field speaking plant. You kind of got to look at the plant and kind of understand its structure. You know, if it's um, kind of um, rooted at the ground and um, can be clumped and broken apart, or if it's woody material, um, or if it's, a, you know, different, you know, all kinds of different ways of um, uh, handling that. Um, I don't know if there's any thoughts you have on pruning, Barbara. I'm good. Let's go. Keep on Next. moving. Um, pruning uh, gnarled Mexican sage. Uh, you can see a lot of a lot of them. They get uh, that kind of woody growth, and you see them get tall and lanky. And then again, you'll see that little lion's tuft. A lot of the times, it's because it's been pruned to a kind of a round shape or you know some kind of a visual shape, but um, hasn't been thinned. So if, uh, if you go through and take some of these long, thin stalks out, you'll oftentimes find these, these little green shoots at the bottom that are just kind of waiting for you to clear out some sunlight for them to pop up. So if you go down and clip those long, thin stems all the way down at the bottom, these other little green ones will pop up uh, real quick um, in the, when, the, when the rains come. Um, and uh, you'll have kind of a real fresh looking plant that's kind of doing its living to its fullest. Um, so it's a pretty simple, simple way to do it. So thin cut. Um, next. Next. Um, some special care for salvias and lavenders and rosemaries. These are some of those woody plants that you'll do some fitting. Um, you'll see some deadheading going on there. On the image to the left, you'll see there's a bunch of seed heads and flower heads that have all kind of spent. And then down below, you can kind of see a little bit of green. Um, and then if you were to look at that image to the right, that's been kind of deadheaded back and thinned out of some of the, the older wood. And there's a lot of a flush of green in there, kind of similar to that last discussion of just going back and, and following some really tall things that are a little bit too big and following them back to a branch. And then you can thin cut, um, not all the way down to the bottom, but you thin it. It's more like a tree, almost like a tree pruning, but not quite. Um, Mm -hmm. um, I'd just like to say that um, these are plants that a lot of people end up getting a lot of wood on mm -hmm. and that's because they don't get pruned in time because people are just enjoying these plants and their flowers and letting them get bigger and bigger but um, particularly the salvias, lavenders and rosemaries they will grow on the new growth the flowers will grow on the new growth so you want to cut back to the wood because if you wait until the next year when the new growth becomes wood, then if you cut back too far, then you're never going to get more, more flowers again. Uh, I guess I'm not saying that right, but um, it's just really important after the first season to make sure that you cut back to where the uh, just the first note above the wood where the wood starts so that you don't let it get too woody or two seasons worth of wood because then only the outside of your plant will be able to um, to flower. Next. Oh, I think we whoops. The succulent. Uh, pruning succulents uh, can be kind of done the same way. Um, they can grow from cuttings very easily. So just cut off the rosette and let that cut dry out for a couple of days so that it calluses over the, the wound. Um, and then you can place that in um, 
some light moist peat moss cactus mix um, or just even in the ground that'll work pretty well um, some care um, and it'll root root quickly and produce a new plant um, propagation from cuttings of succulents is a really fun thing to do in the garden and a, um, a fun gifts for your for friends and family and um, yeah, very simple plant to play with. And a wonderful thing that I would say just to start with, if it's if you're just starting out, succulents are an excellent way to get into gardening. You can you can start to see your green thumb go back and forth. They kill you pretty easily, but it's hard to kill them. <laughs> so, uh, whereas natives are much more finicky and, um, you know, to water or not to, you know, when when to water and when not to water, they can they can croak at the very easily. Um, but the succulents, they're very, they're very stable. Um, so that's pretty fun. Yeah, next. Um, mulch does a garden good. Um, one of the most important things you can do for the garden, water less and control weeds. Um, use free county mulch to complete the local recycling loop. Um, mulch is a wonderful, wonderful tool. It's the simplest way to clean up a garden, I would say. Um, and you're also feeding it and storing water, long-term water. Uh, um, a two to four inch layer of mulch um, keeps back evaporation and weeds. Um, and it's really just like a wonderful thing to just clean up the garden. It really gives that contrast in the garden. Um, so. Yeah. I I just want to say that um, for people who don't like the look of the county mulch, that we recommend that you get county mulch and put it down and then get some kind of topper, um, another kind of mulch that you like, that you prefer, that you would buy, um, instead of trying to just use uh, mulch that, that you buy. It's not only more expensive. This county mulch is so rich, it's been, um, composted in windrows so that it breaks down really um, easily into healthy soil and it's a great additive for your garden. Next. Mm -hmm. um, three inch application, um, uh, one cubic yard will cover approximately 109 square feet, a four inch application uh, one cubic yard will cover approximately 81 square feet. Um, a six inch application, one cubic yard will cover approximately 40, uh, 54 square feet. Uh, mulch breaks down and will need to be reapplied periodically. Um, let's see here. Um, more info, uh, lessismore.org at um, slash mulch rebate there's a rebate from the city of santa barbara um on that uh, we again we use just we use mulch just everywhere it's a wonderful wonderful thing um to get spread out in the garden and make it look beautiful one thing i would consider on just anytime we are putting mulch down though is to be cautious of the root color of any perennial plant mm -hmm. and to uh be sure that the mulch is not built up on that trunk because once that starts to happen, then you start to bring in uh, pathogens and things like that from the mulch. So we want a nice little, uh, we want mulch down there, but we want it to be not built up against that trunk collar where you see the trunk of a tree is very easy to see, but it, you know, it kind of goes up out of the ground and then kind of starts to taper in. So there's that little thick spot. I want to be sure that the, the mulch is below that. Mm -hmm. Good point. Next. Um, boosting soil and mulch fertility. So compost tea helps create bi biologically rich soil. Healthy soil uses less water. Um, easy, to, easy to apply can, can have long lasting effects, including pest mitigation and treatment of disease. Um, healthy soil is excellent, excellent at storing water. Um, one metric of healthy soil is uh, carbon. And if you increase the carbon 1% per acre um, in the soil, you can store up to 20,000 more gallons of water in that same uh, bit of land. So 
getting that mulch down and getting plants down increases your carbon content and will only get better at that over time. Therefore, you'll keep increasing your water uh, storing capacity in the soil. Um, so boosting the soil and um, mulch fertility is a huge component of uh, storing water and plant health overall. And um, I just want to say that you can make your own compost tea. It's a little complicated. You need to aerate it. It's not just, uh, it's not a compost liquid. It's actually a, a, a tea that um, you add compost and you can add other elements that um, fungi and bacteria like to eat. Um, however, there are also, there's also compost tea available from different landscape companies who make it all the time, who are, um, you know, kind of like experts and have the equipment to do that. So you don't have to be intimidated into thinking if you don't come up with all this apparatus and gadgets and stuff that you can't use compost tea. You can definitely buy it also um, locally. Next. Uh, sheet mulching um, over time, and um, this can be a huge reducer of weeds. Uh, and um, what you can see there is a little bit of the grass kind of popping up through some of the mulch that can be weeded out and should be weeded out rather quickly. Shouldn't be let to go, otherwise it'll kind of start to regain traction in the garden. But uh, sheet mulching is a wonderful way to eliminate grass overall. Um, but you need to, again, you need to stay on it. The grass will, will keep coming back, particularly around the edges of concrete or the edges of that con the, the cardboard or the edges of the garden that you didn't car you know, sheet mulch. Uh, but sheet mulching is an excellent way to get ahead of the grass so that you can then you know, plant your, um, the things that you want in the garden as a replacement, more water-wise things and, and whatnot. Yeah, I'd just like to say that, um... We don't really have time to go into the process of sheet mulching here, and that's not part of the purpose of this maintenance um, class, but there are various ways to do sheet mulching. This bomb proof sheet mulch is one example. It can also be simpler, as simple as um, cardboard and mulch. Um, but what we actually wanted to look at here was just to make sure that people know that when you do sheet mulching, there is some maintenance that needs to be done afterwards. And that's why we call it tending over time. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's really important is that if there are little tufts of grass or other kinds of unwanted um, plants that are coming up through your sheet mulch, it's really important to get them as soon as you see them. When they're small, it, it's, you have to keep a frequent uh, look, but, um, it makes maintenance a lot simpler and quicker and easier to get them when they're small because what they've done is that they have finally found the way to come up through the, through the mulch and through the cardboard to hit the sun. And as soon as they get the sun, they're gonna to start to photosynthesize. So you want to pull them out as far down, you know, go as far down in the root uh, to as much as the root as you can get and pull it out as completely as it can and then it won't have the um, carbohydrates to grow back up again. Mm -hmm. I, I do bet and guarantee that it will be back in places and that we, it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter of staying vigilant, in particular in the areas that it's, it's got a real good stronghold. It's, it, it's a long battle to take out uh, Bermuda and Kikuya. Even if, the right, even if you've got all the good situation going for you, I would bet nine times out of 10, it'll be back if you, and, and, and in those cases, if you don't stay vigilant, it'll come back even stronger. <laughs> yeah, so I meant that that particular yeah. root won't come back. There will yeah, be yeah. others that will be coming back. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, thank cool. you, Josh. Go on. Yeah. Oh. And here's that question there. Let's find out. <laughs> I 
<laughs> nice. Good. I figured if you were taking this class, you were probably maintaining your garden. But anyway, it's great to know. Uh, weeding and your seed bank. Weeding over time will reduce the weed seed bank and your soils. This will help to promote and nurture desired seeds. Consistency is key. Um, and uh, in, in restoration, we were doing uh, uh, some work out by the airport and we were removing um, some dock that comes up quite frequently in the, and in the restoration class, they described how if you don't get the seeds uh, when they pop up and you allow them to go out and replant themselves, you got you just reset it another 10 years. And so the key is, is always go after the one, you know, just keep maintaining it at the right time and, and doing, going after the weeds when they pop up, just like we were talking about with the grass is just consistent. Consistency is the key. It's really just to hammer that one home. Uh, next slide. Uh, integrated pest management. Realistically speaking, we've been discussing a lot of that most of the whole time here. Um, integrated pest management is cultural, it's physical, it's biological, it's chemical. Um, when we talk about cultural, it's about prevention and health and changing the strategies using mulch and effective pruning. Um, that's more, I guess, effective pruning is actually physical, um, but physical removal of pests, such as like water blasting, pruning, putting up barriers. Um, biological things are planting um, insectary plants, things that will draw in the beneficial insects, which are also a part of the integrated pest management is the beneficial insects. We're trying to call them in. And the very last ditch effort is uh, using chemical stuff when it's just beyond uh, our control there. And, and um, those are to do some specific things. And we try to, we try to not do that whenever possible. Our company in general really does not do that. Um, but anyway, the, that's part of the IPM deal there. Um, so you can see there are some different pests. You see some aphids. Um, I can't remember what that other one is there. I think. Um, can't remember what bug that one is. But um, you know, the aphids are farmed by the ants and they're dragged up there. And so a nice little water blasting of aphids can do a good job of just get physical removing physically removing them. You don't really need to do any type of spraying to do that. Um, and then sometimes if it's too bad with those aphids, you might want to just pinch it off and, and get it away. Um, just kind of depends on your infestation. Um, so integrated pest management is about trying to do the, the best thing we can do, which is um, be nice to the plants and be nice to the environment without doing chemicals, but doing it um, in these more simple natural ways. I don't know if you got any thoughts on that one, Barbara. Yeah. We can keep on keeping on there in the next slide. Um, neem oil and other horticultural oils, those are those um, those are the things that we would use in that more of that chemical zone um, when the time was right. We'd want to limit those. Um, if you use too much, too many horticultural oils, you can damage the leaves of plants. Um, they can get some burn and um, you can actually start to call in some other pests. So overusing chemicals can also be a, be a harm, but, but these use appropriately very if, with right amounts and at the right time, they can be very effective and not be uh, a major harm to the garden. But we try to minimize their use as much as possible. Next. Next. Uh, gopher traps here. Uh, these, I mean, these are, uh, we deal with gophers all the time in gardening. Uh, what you see on the left there is the iconic green Maccabee trap. I know that's tricky because it's in black and white, but it's iconically green. I assure you of that. Um, then there's the Victor black box there in the middle. Uh, these two are um, very commonly used, wonderful. They're a little bit more challenging. You got to kind of dig out the tunnels and set the boxes. Sometimes you using some bait is really helpful. Um, what you see on the right is one that we use more often in the field these days is called the gopher hawk. It's got a little probe and you kind of like probe around and find the gopher hole. And then once you do, you make another bigger hole and then you kind of insert this deal down in there. And then funnily enough, I have one that's busted in half here that we've <laughs> see the parts. Um, and this is like this little switch here. 
there's a spring, it's spring loaded. Uh, so you set the spring and then it pop. So it pops when this little trap that's set down in the tunnel here, you can kind of see it's got this little swinging deal here. That's the little trigger. Gopher hits that and then this thing goes up and gets them. Uh, gophers are a pest that they're just, if you want to keep a garden alive, they are there. They are there all, often. We find them all over the place in Santa Barbara and managing them is a challenge. Um, but, you, but you can do it. You can push them out to the fences and hold them off to the fences. But just like those other weeds, it's, you got to kind of stay on it. Consistency is key. As soon as they get back in, they're going to start creating havoc again for a little while at least. But uh, there are some options there. But go after the gopher hawk. It's nice and easy. Next. Uh, these are some helpful tools here um, for the garden. Um, you got a little spray bottle and some buckets there um, for cleaning of the tools. Um, and then all those tools you got on the side there, you got some some shears and some pruning, some pruners there and a little uh, little grubbing hoe there and some weeding stuff and a handsaw and um, a little uh, hori hori uh, knife there. That's a that little digging tool, which is an excellent uh, deal for the garden. We've really replaced that replaces a trowel wonderfully. It's great for weeding and, and planting and a whole bunch of list of things. So we use that one a lot. Um, what's not up there are loppers. Uh, we suggest getting a nice pair of loppers. Those are some helpful things in the garden. Um, yeah, otherwise those are some pretty handy dandy tools there. Next. Uh, maintaining your water wise garden will allow plants and soil to flourish and thrive for years to come. And uh, yeah, building the soil health is really just the key in all of the gardens, getting the plants in there, getting the mulch down, getting those, and um, the, the mulch really helps with the weeds and the moisture, and then helps those native plants and other climate appropriate plants that you want to get to thrive and then, and and really holds out those other weeds until they get to size and they can hold off on their own. And then weeding becomes much, much less. And um, as you change the soil biology, um, you'll start to get rid of a lot of the weeds that were that would pop up in the other in the oil, other soil biology that you had previously, the compacted dirt or whatever else. You know, but if you have a nice garden with mulch, maybe you're not having such as such an issue. But um, anyway. I think that's Next it. There. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Josh. So um, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A feature down below. We've had a few come in. And then I just wanted to highlight one of our programs. I saw that a lot of folks were interested in learning about irrigation. And irrigation can be really site specific. So what we've given you here are some broad guidelines in terms of um, the differences between drip irrigation and spray irrigation and manual versus automatic. But we do have a uh, free service for our water customers that's called a free irrigation evaluation. We used to do these in person, so we've adapted with the times. Um, and what we can offer customers is a phone consult or a FaceTime consult. So if you wanna take your cell phone out to your irrigation system and have one of our specialists on the phone and point to things and talk about what you're seeing and does this valve look right? And I have this timer set for this amount of time. Does that seem correct? Um, we do have that uh, option. We've most recently had a few folks who've had um, like a change in their irrigation system or um, a power outage, as Josh said, that could lead to some irrigation scheduling problems with timers. So we're always happy to go through those settings with folks and see um, if there's anything that we have recommendation wise. So in the chat feature, I'm gonna put the phone number for our conservation program. You can just leave a voicemail with your, with your phone number and your, um, account information and just let us know that you want a free irrigation evaluation and we'll be happy to um, set that up for you. So I'll put that in the chat and Mariana, if you could go through some of the questions we've received. Sure, yeah. Um, and if anyone else has any more questions, please either put them in the Q&A area or the chat. I know a couple of you have been doing that. Before uh, we move on, I know there was a couple of comments regarding the mulch. Um, 
couple of folks wanted to share with the group that they've used the county's free mulch um, underneath their kind of like that first layer in their landscape and then that they've used the screen mulch that's been kind of their bought uh, product that's more filtered and you're less likely to find other items in it as a top layer. So Barbara did mention that there was other uh, mulch out there and someone wanted the group to know that the county mulch has been used as a cover successfully. Um, so a couple of questions we have, I'll start with the first one for Barbara and Josh. Um, a couple of folks want to know what your recommendation would be for drought tolerant, environmentally friendly lawns that would be um, successful in the area. Well, um, most, law, most grasses are more like um, medium water use instead of so drought tolerant. Um, there are some that are more drought tolerant, but that's um, often why we will like create a vernal pool, which is a, a certain kind of earthworks that will bring um, rainwater into an area that will fill with water in the winter. And we've done that like for a Carex meadow or Carex lawn. But a lot of times we um, look more to do a kind of like meadowy kind of effect instead of an actual lawn. Um, and then we'll bring in some water-wise plants like yarrows and other things that belong in native meadows. Um, but most native kind of grasses are a little more water intensive um, than really water-wise. But if what you want is a flat lawn that is just drought tolerant. Um, we've had some varying uh, success with different things. Um, Carapia, it, it kind of depends on what the use of the lawn is. Are you going to be using it a lot? Are you going to have dogs and kids playing on it? Then that kind of like limits your choices more. Um, some people have had success with the uh, the UC Verde. Um, some people have had success with the uh, bent grass. I don't know. What do you think, Josh? I mean, those are the ones that we've used in some of the Carex. A lot of the things, a lot of the more, like you were saying, the more uh, drought tolerant grasses um, happen to be also more tufty, less uh, rhizomatous, it feels like. So they don't really spread evenly. They kind of spread more in tufts. So it's like until they fill in those tufts, it doesn't feel as even. Um, and then the other difference would be care in a lot of those things too, is that the, uh, um, you know, there's not, it's not really like a mowed lawn that we've really found a good replacement for, but the bent grass and the buffalo grass, those are the, have been the, um, so I'll put in a link um, in the chat to one of our handouts of mm -hmm. waterwise lawn alternatives. Because like Barbara said, it sort of depends on what you're looking for. Is it a flat green surface that gives the appearance of a lawn? Is it a recreated mm -hmm. area? There's, um, there's a variety of things that have been tested and there's luckily new stuff that's being developed. Um, mm -hmm. But Carapia has been one that for the past few years seems to be pretty popular. And if you want to see and feel it, um, it's available at the Trinity Lutheran Church um, on State Street and Mitchell Terrena. They have it in two areas and that's been um, planted. One section was planted in pl uh, plugs and one was in sod. So they sort of tested out both kinds, but that's one that we send people to as a public demonstration because all the other ones are residential. Um, but that is one that seems to, to grow in quickly and um, can tolerate some foot traffic. It's just, it's not, you know, a sports field. So that's a, I encourage you to take a look at the flyer that I linked below. And if you want to see and feel um, an alternative, then check out the Trinity Lutheran Church. One thing I'll mention too with the grasses that we've done some plugs where we, I think there was one we did was I think it was Carex progressilis. It was like kind of a newly developed mm -hmm. a um, chia. version, a chia. 
and it um, it was you know the, the the challenge of what we're doing when we're going through kind of adding some new grasses and new things to the yards that we don't necessarily know what they're going to do even though we like we we have some idea so we've put out a couple we put out one of these grasses and then it kind of quickly reverted back to its more genetic early genetic baseline stages and it they started pushing up taller grasses so we wanted something that was short and we it ended up after a couple of cuttings it ended up going from short back to tall so they're I don't want to like preach too much caution on some of those things, but maybe a little bit because um, some of them have some of the grasses haven't been tested and we don't necessarily know what they're going to do long term. So that could be a challenge, but yeah. All right, thank you. So this question's for the entire group. Um, we have a couple of people who'd like to know where they can find native plants. Well, there's many places where you can get native plants in Santa Barbara. There's always the Santa Barbara Botanic Gardens is a place that we, you know, highly recommend because people uh, there know a lot about natives and can give you a lot of information when you're there in their shop. Um, and uh, just most nurseries, um, any of the local nurseries I think have native plants in them now it's they're mm -hmm. kind of popular plants yeah, we don't this... advise that you go into the mountains and try to uh, propagate plants from the natives that are in the mountains um, we really need those plants to stay there and and to grow there and to not be picked um... I'd also say uh, the SBCC has a yearly um, plant sale that they do with native, a lot of native plants that are involved there. And then um, oh, SNS, SB... SNS Seeds does seeds for wildflower stuff. So that's another um, place to get some native plants. And then also Island Seed and Feed is a, a really good um, space for that too. And, and also I'm remembering that um, Santa Barbara Natives, which is out in like Gaviota, mm -hmm. they are okay. really cool because they do natives like canyon by canyon, like what will grow here exactly in this local place. And um, that's a really, it's, it's a little out of the way, but it's a really fun place and the people who run it are very knowledgeable. Great. And Madeline, could you tell us a little bit also about like plant selection and the online um, resource for selecting plants? Sure. So we have a really handy uh, website that can be accessed on our homepage. And actually, Mariana, if you're able to just plunk the link into the chat, um, this will sort of be a guided plant search where you can take a look at local garden galleries, um, you can either select by front entryways, um, plants that grow on the slope, plants that grow under oak trees. Um, there's a variety of ways that you can do plant searches to find uh, medium and low water use plants. And then those that are native also have a little icon on them. And then um, the other thing that we have is our WaterWise native plant booklet that we developed in conjunction with the Botanic Garden. And Mariana, if you're able to add that link to the chat as well, um, that's a great resource. There's a picture and it talks about each plant that is recommended for the Santa Barbara area as a waterways native. So that's a great resource. And then like Barbara said, talking to the garden growers nursery at the Botanic Garden um, is another great way to, to sort of step into natives or add to your native collection. Great. And like Madeline said, we included a couple links in the chat both to the Waterwise Gardening website, as well as the water checkups and our Waterwise Landscape Notebook. Um, however, if there's only one website you remember today or write down, I would suggest it being santabarbarastate.gov slash waterwise, as all the, um, those items I've mentioned are linked from that page. So Barbara and Josh, the next question. I have for you is if the list of maintenance tools that you provided is that available anywhere online? Uh, 
Probably not, but I mean, there's probably, I mean, the, the images and all that stuff are going to be there. Um, there are some books and stuff that have, that have those things in there uh, listed, um, but uh, it's not a bad idea. Well, we, could, we could make a list. Yeah. We could Certainly. make a list and put it on the Sweetwater um, website mm -hmm. under the learn more category. But, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of excellent tools available. Very, very good ones that we use often. Um, so we can make some of the recommendations of our favorites as well on there. So. Yeah, we'll do that. Great. And then I have another question. Um, if you can provide the best or information on the best method to check the carbon soil levels. Mm. Uh, well, that that kind of stuff is really starting to come online. If you go to look at the um, Soil Health Academy uh, org, I believe um, they have a kind of a list of a bunch of different um, ways to go. I, there, there are three basic tests that they try to go for to kind of go, for, um, have that stuff. I, sorry, I don't have that off the top of my head right now. You, um, but, um, soilhealthacademy.org is a wonderful place to go look to find where you can get those tests and they're starting to do it more and more all over the state. Um, uh, we, maybe we can put that in with the, the, the tool, Mm -hmm. tool list that put those um, three three soil tests on there, the recommendations for that. Um. Okay. Great. This next question is for Madeline. Uh, Madeline, how can uh, participants access the recording from today's class? Good question. So we have um, on our City website, we've got a whole section for waterwise gardening, and we're going to post that. Um, let me see if I can pull up the link. We'll post that on the main page. And some folks have already reached out to us about the um, getting the recording specifically emailed to them, which we're happy to do. So you don't have to remember to check back for it. So if you could just put your email address in the chat. We'll make sure that once it's posted, it'll be posted on YouTube, so it'll be accessible to watch at any time. We'll just send you the link, um, and also it'll be posted on the Sweetwater Collaborative website as well. Um, the city's website, as you can imagine, is very vast. There's a lot on it. I always recommend using the search feature on the city's website to find something. Um, so it'll be on our, our WaterWise landscaping page, but if you just um, post your email address, that'll be the quickest way. And it'll probably be next week that we'll have it trimmed and uploaded and ready to see. Uh, great. And I think that is all the questions. If anyone else has any questions for Madeline or any of the presenters today, uh, if you can please enter them in the chat box. Um, if not, I think we're actually out of time. And for those of you who've entered your email, addresses, we will make sure you get notification uh, when the class recording is up. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. All right. Thanks everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.